So 30 years, this, you know, a lot can happen. I'm not going to be able to cover much uh, in an hour. I'm going to focus on a couple of things. So the first part of the talk is going to be about research, and the second part of the talk is going to be about teaching. On the research side, I'm actually kind of kind of focus on my personal methodology for research. I develop some techniques of how I did research and some sort of philosophies, and then I will be instantiating that with a bunch of very specific research results in areas much like he mentioned. Uh, on teaching, I'm going to tell you about MOOCs and MOICs. And you've probably heard the word MOOC, and you've probably never heard the word MOIC. So I'm going to make you wait for about 40 minutes, probably, before you're going to hear what that's about. All right. So I also want to say, I think we have a question and answer period afterwards, but I'm perfectly happy to take questions during the talk. So anytime you have a question, I might even pause at times. It's totally fine. I'd rather have some type of interaction with the audience than just everybody sitting here. So don't hesitate any time at all. OK. You'll also see every once in a while the pop-up of MM. So the title of the talk is Magic Moments in Research and Teaching. And I'm going to highlight a few times when I think sort of something really special happened uh, in my experience. OK. So I'm going to start by talking about the process of finding research topics. And this process might be most interesting to people here who are graduate students or young faculty thinking, how do you find a research topic? I have never thought of myself as a visionary. I always, in fact, like to think of myself as an anti-visionary. These days, as dean, I have to pretend to be visionary because people often ask, hey, what's the future in 10 or 15 years? And I have to now have an answer. But that wasn't really how I thought about uh, research. Yet I had a bunch of successful projects, and I actually feel like I found a recipe that I used um, for most of my research career. Um, at, and it worked pretty well in my area of databases and information management. When I've given this talk, other people have told me, yeah, it kind of makes sense in their area as well, probably mostly in the software systems area, I would say. And I am going to tell you the recipe. So here's the recipe that I've used for most of my research. I've worked, as I said, in database systems. And it turns out database systems, databases, information and management in general tends to rely on a bunch of assumptions. And I'm going to give you examples momentarily. And my approach is to say, look at the types of assumptions that are being made about these systems or about their languages or models, and just pick one of those assumptions and drop it. Just say, what if that assumption is no longer true? In the area of database systems, if you drop an assumption, generally the whole thing kind of falls apart. I think of it a little bit like a sweater where you, if a piece of yarn comes out, the whole thing kind of unravels. And in database systems, once you drop an assumption, you often need to re reconsider many different aspects of data management, of query processing. And the good thing about that, if you're a professor, if you have to can reconsider many different aspects, is that you get many PhD theses out of it, one for each student. Always excellent to divide things up that way. And I've always been interested in having my research group build software prototypes. And if everything falls apart when you drop an assumption, then you can build a new prototype from scratch, which for me has always been a fun part of research. OK. so. Let me just go straight to what I mean by a simple but fundamental assumption. And this is very much specific to database systems. And for each assumption, I'll talk about what happens when you drop it. So one of the assumptions is that when you build a database, the first thing you do is declare the structure or schema of the database in advance. So you declare what the structure of the data is going to be. And then after that, you can start loading data and querying that data. Drop that, you get the area of semi-structured or self-describing data. So XML would be an example of that, or JSON. Those are data, data models, if you want to think of them, where you don't have to declare the schema in advance. You just have the data and the schema kind of mixed up together. And people call that semi-structured data. Another example, 
that the data that you have, you typically gather your data and you put it in a repository on a disk, or it's not really the disk that I care about, but just that the data is gathered. It's generally kind of stable. You might change it here and there, but you're querying a database. Drop that and you have the notion of data streams. So instead of having a big bunch of data where you're asking questions and doing analyses, typically you'll have like standing queries and the data will come streaming through and what you're interested in is how the query answer changes as your data streams by, which is flipping around the idea of having the data sitting there and you ask the queries. Data elements contain known values. Most database systems, you'll think you'll have numbers and strings and what images and whatever in your database. If you drop that assumption, you have the notion of uncertain data, where you're not always clear on what the value might be. It might be one of possible values, a range, probabilistic data, for example. Another example, data is gathered and processed by a computer. You might imagine that to be the case. If you drop that, there's a notion of crowdsourced data management, where part of your data might be provided by humans, or part of your processing might be provided by humans. So these are examples, all of which are research projects that I've done, where we've dropped an assumption. I'm going to talk a little bit today about data streams and uncertain data. Uh, I won't be talking about all these, and I'm not going to make any attempt to review all these projects by any means. Okay, so that's what, those are some simple but fundamental assumptions. What does it mean to reconsider all aspects of database processing? In a traditional database system, you have a data model. How is your data structured? You have a query language. How do you ask questions over that data once you have it? Um, how do you store your data? What indexing structures do you put on it to make access to the data fast? Um, if you have a question, how do you optimize the processing to get the answer to that? Concurrency control, recovery, application and user interfaces. These are all things you would you learn in a bread and butter database course, right? But you'd typically learn it about relational databases and maybe one other type of database. But again, when you drop those assumptions, each one of these has to be reconsidered. Okay. So, this recipe of picking an assumption and dropping it and then reconsidering everything, it's kind of a formula. It's really worked. I'm going to say that's the first magic moment. Uh, it's a little bit of a magic moment in retrospect, but that is um, a magic moment in figuring out that that's how one can have these fairly substantial research projects. Okay? So that's, yes? There are many assumptions you can draw. Some are interesting, some are not. But yep. <laughs> Uh, trial and error, I guess. I think that you can pretty quickly think about what the impact is of dropping an assumption. Right. But I don't have a better answer than that. But I do think this concept mo does translate to other areas as well. But again, I think a uh, hunch. Certainly not visionary. Right. I, right. I, do, I actually don't have a great answer for that. Yep. But I love questions. Even when I don't have a great answer, yes. Well, in software engineering, lately we've been taking all the assumptions about the way people program and just testing them. Yeah, working. yeah, okay, yeah. And yep. about half of them bear out and half of them don't. Right, yeah, so that's a great example, actually. You People, people make assumptions in that case about how people are coding and might turn out those are wrong and that might drive research in a different direction. Yeah. Yep, that's a good, that's so a great that's way to find, yep, yep. Yep, well, that makes a lot of sense, absolutely. Okay, so now let's say it's time to approach a new topic. I also have a philosophy about approaching a new topic. Um, and I'm going to start by this idea of reconsidering all aspects of a database system. So I listed them, data model, query language, and so on. I'm going to restructure this a little and say the first thing one has to do, think about, is the data model. How are you going to, if you're going to build a new type of database system, unstructured data, data streams, uncertain data, you first need to figure out how is that data going to be modeled. And by that, mean I, I, don't, I don't mean that in a machine learning model. I actually, data model is meant to be the structure of the data, the structuring mechanism like relational or graph structured, for example. 
Then once you know what your data is going to look like, how do you ask questions over the data? And then I'm just going to say the rest of it is just implementation. That's, I, that's actually kind of my view. The rest of it is systems questions around the implementation. And I believe it's quite important actually to get the first part right, the data model and query language, before going on to the implementation. So I'm even going to change this a little and say I really separate it into the foundations if you're building a new type of database system and then the implementation. And my very strong philosophy has been that you have to get your foundations right before you do your implementation. And that's been a philosophy of how I've worked. So I'd say I've actually built my entire research career on this approach. And one thing I have to say is actually that's kind of easy in database systems to build your research career on that approach because I would say that our field is guilty of frequently not doing this. People frequently want to go straight to building the system before they even figure out what they're building a system for. And I'm going to give you a very concrete example of that. So I'm going to say that's another magic moment is this idea that in the field of databases, really taking a look at foundations before implementing is, um, is an important thing. OK. So now I'm going to tell you about the dubious beginning with this regard in databases with the SQL query language. How many people read SQL in the room? Excellent. OK. Um, even if you don't, you'll get the example. So SQL was meant to be a declarative language. It was one of the first declarative languages. It's one of the big features of SQL. In SQL, the semantics of the language is independent of the execution model. A query in SQL says what you want. It doesn't say how to get it, right? So if your SQL query says, this is the classic, find all employees who earn more than their manager, it's not saying open this file, iterate through this file, open this other file, iterate, match the records. It just says find me the employees who earn more than the manager and the system will figure out the best way to execute that. Okay? So that's great, except not everyone thinks of SQL as a declarative language. For some people, the only way they seem to understand it is the execution model. Okay, so I'm going to give you an example from the very, very early days of SQL where people built a system that they didn't actually know how it behaved, I would say. And so we're going to have a table called T, very simple. T is just going to be a bunch of values in and at, just one column of values. And all I want to do is decrement, subtract one from the below average value in the tables. table. Okay? Very simple, right? All the below average values decrement one. Okay, so here it is in SQL. Update table T, set A, A is the attribute of T, T has one attribute called A. Set A equals A minus 1, where A is less than the subquery that gets the average value from the table. Okay? Pretty easy, right? All right. Here's my table. It has three values in it. Four, one, two. What is the contents of my table after this update system? this update runs. What are the, th I'm going to wait for an answer. <laughs> By the way, the average of 1, 2, and 4 is greater than 2, right? <laughs> just, I'll just give you that. You don't have to do that arithmetic. The average is greater than 2. So what are the contents of the table after it runs? Any volunteers? Yes? 4, 0, and 1. 4, 0, and 1 sounds pretty good. That's what some systems did. Any other volunteers? 4, 0, and 2, that's what other systems did. Whoa, that's nasty, isn't it? That's the beginning of SQL where people didn't pay any attention to defining what the query meant. So in some people's view, you computed the average, which is something over 2. You've got that number, and then you go through and you say, is this less? No. This one's less, so I'll set that to 0. This one's less, so I'll set that to 1. That's some systems. Then the other people who weren't really paying attention to, and that's a good, that's probably what it should mean. Don't you all agree? Yeah. Then there was the other system that said, okay, I'm going to go in my table and I'm going to update them one at a time. So I'm going to get number four. I'll compute the average. It's not less than the average. Fine. I'll go to one. I'll compute the average. The average is a little over two. I'll set it to zero. I'll go to two. I'll compute the average. Oh, the average is now two, so I don't update that one. 
except in relational database systems, the order is irrelevant. So on another day, that system could do it in this order, one, two, four, and get a different answer, or two, one, four. And then it would get yet a different answer. Database systems will actually get different answers on different days if you don't know what you're doing. So this is just an example of how easy it is in databases to make a big research impact just by knowing what your queries are supposed to do. OK, but they fixed that. They, somebody said, all right, I know. I'll define the semantics that you evaluate the subquery, get the result, and then do the update. OK, that's good. Though this was a frowny face at the time. Here's another example. Regional average temperatures. So you have a bunch of regions, and you want the average temperature for each region. Here it is in SQL. Select the region and the average temperature grouping by the region. I left out the table here just to keep it simple. So this one you kind of have to know SQL. Here's, we've got two regions, the west and the east. Um, and you can see, if you know SQL at all, that the answer will be west, average is 60, and in the east, the average is 15, right? That's all good. Everybody gets the same answer on that one. What if you add city to the select clause? What do you think it should do? What should it do? There's a very, to me, very obvious answer of what it should do. Throw an error. Thank you. Who was that? Thank you. It should throw an error, and some systems do, but they don't all. SQLite will not throw an error for you here. SQLite will choose a random city from your group. It'll say west, 60, and then one of those two cities. And maybe it'll give you a different city on different days. And, it, it, and it'll give you east, 15, and one of those cities. And literally, without changing the database, tomorrow I could get a different random city because the disk got reorganized. Okay? But this still happens now, and I assure you that this is in production software, assumptions about how this behaves in your self-driving car. <laughs> Hopefully not. Right. OK, so another bad news. So that's the beginning in databases. So I believe this is just a function of people not thinking about the foundations before implementation, not defining the semantics, in that case, of the SQL query language before the implementation. So hopefully I've, I, I've convinced you that in databases, at least, that's an important thing to do. So I'm just going to go through a few examples from my own work. So Sunny mentioned that I worked on triggers. They were called active rules at the time. Uh, this was when I was at IBM, actually. So in a database, you can put in these things called triggers that monitor the database and make changes automatically. Standard in all database systems these days. And you just write these rules that says when some action occurs, if a condition holds, perform action. So it's monitoring the database as it's changing. The action would be looking for certain insert deletes and updates on tables. The condition would be some SQL condition. And then the action, whoops, would be to perform additional SQL. So again, this is now standard in databases. So as a warm up, here's a couple of examples. We have one trigger that says when new sales are inserted into the database. If the sale is greater than 500, give the seller a bonus of 100. And a second rule that says when new sales are inserted, if the total sales exceed 1,000, increase all salaries by 10%. OK? All right. So let's suppose that we insert three sales. Mary sold 600, John sold 300, and Mary sold another 400. And that activates our trigger because we inserted those. All right. What happens in this case? This is the easy case. So from the first one, when Mary sold, has a sale more than 500, she gets a bonus of 100. And then after all of these inserts, the total sales exceeded 1,000, so everybody gets their salary increased. So Mary gets a bonus of 100 and the 10% increase that everybody gets. And John gets the 10% increase because the total was greater than 1,000. Easy stuff, right? This one clear? People with me? Nod? OK, thank you. All right. Trickier. So you could have given the 10% rate before the 100 points. 
Uh, it only went over 1,000 if these were inserted in a row at the end. This is a 10% this is a 10 increase to their salary. Okay, so uh, think of the bonuses. Is, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, you're getting to the issue here. But on this one, I think we would all agree. I think people would be comfortable. It's a, just a bonus. It's not a, sorry. The first one's just a bonus. That's separate. The second is increasing the salary. You're already jumping ahead to the tricky. That's why I made it a bonus, separate from the salary. Yep. So this one, I think we'd all agree about what happens. All right. The tricky example is when we make it a raise instead of a bonus, which is what you were thinking of. And furthermore, I'm going to change the sales to be 800 and 600. OK. So in this case, I would just simply say it is not obvious what should happen. OK? So how many raises does Mary get? Does she get one for the 800 or, and one for the 600? Or does she just get one because there exists a sale greater than, five, uh, greater than 500? How many times has everyone's salary increased? It went over 1,000, then it went over 1,000 again. And which of Mary's salary, this is what you were thinking about, is the 10% applied to? So I'm not going to say there's an answer. There's no right answer to each of these questions. But there is a right answer in defining very clearly a semantics for these types of rules and how they behave so you know what the answer is going to be. So I'm going to bring you way back when I, was, I said I did this work at IBM. Yes? Is it significant that the one asked when sales are inserted rather than the A sales inserted? Yeah, that is sort of significant. And if you want to consider a batch, that's right. Yes? So it's not by sale. The, well, one can make a choice. One can make a choice. You could say it's for each individual sale, or you could say it's the whole batch together. Well, uh, yeah. and that's a I difference. Yep. Yep. Sales yep. That the whole batch must be two yeah, that's fine. One. Well, that was my decision when I designed a rule system. Yes, but it wasn't everybody's. It was not everybody's decision to do it that way. So it was mayhem. Different, different researchers, different systems were making different decisions. Well, people in general have a real ambiguity problem between singular and plural. Well, that's true. In this case, I'm talking about plural. Yeah, OK. So, right. you, so you are making that statement. Yes, I am. Okay. Yep. Yeah. Yep. OK, so this is the IBM Almaden Research Center in San Jose. I don't know how many people have been there. This is where I was doing that work. Who's been there? This is me back in the early days. <laughs> and when I was working at IBM, when I went to IBM, I was tasked to add a active rule or trigger system to the research prototype that was being built there called Starburst, an extensible database system. So I was coming out of a PhD in program verification, so I started thinking about semantics. I thought about transition tables, conflicts, confluence, all these types of things. And then there was this other guy working there named Bruce Lindsay. Anybody know Bruce? Bruce used to stand outside the door where I would go in and out smoking. You weren't allowed to smoke in the building. And every time I went by, he'd ask me if I was coding yet. So he did, I, seriously, he'd say, stop thinking about foundations. Stop thinking about semantics. It's time to write code. And I said, sorry, still thinking about semantics. Eventually, I did write the code. In fact, I spent a whole year coding. But I spent a lot of time thinking about foundations first. Worse, there was this place across the bay, UC Berkeley. And UC Berkeley had a competitive research project to ours at IBM Almaden. And there was a history of competition because there was also System R and uh, Ingress, I think, from way back. So there's this history of competition between the two places. And there was a guy there named Mike Stonebreaker. And while I was sitting there thinking about theory and Bruce was there telling me I should be coding, Mike was announcing that their competitive project had finished their trigger system ages ago, all implemented and ready to go. And so my question to Mike was, what does it do? And my question was more specific than that. I actually sent him a set of triggers. And I said, what's the behavior of this set of triggers in your system? That was the question I asked him. It was what a tricky one, like the example I showed. And here was his response. I need to run it to find out. <laughs> Literally, that was his response. So that, for me, was another magic moment 
when I realized I wanted to build systems where you didn't need to run them to find out how they worked. Okay, another, any questions? All right, another tricky area, data streams. Imagine you have a temperature sensor that's giving you a stream of temperature values. So you've got a timestamp, 4 o'clock it was 72, 415 was 74, 420, 76. Time, temperature, stream of values. With data streams, as I said, what you tend to do is have a continuous or standing query. You might say, at all times, I want to know the average of the most recent three readings. So as the new values stream in, you keep updating that average value. So the first three, after you've got the first three, the average is 74. Then when you get the next reading, you've got 70, okay, because it's the, next, the average of the most recent three. When the one at 7.05 comes in, you're at 64.7, and when the 7.30 reading comes in, you're at 58. I think everybody agrees on that, right? That would be good answers for that query, okay? Pretty clear. Here is another example. Three readings with a timestamp 4 o'clock and three readings at the timestamp 7 o'clock. Wind forward, and it's not Berkeley versus IBM Almaden anymore, it's Berkeley versus Stanford, and we're both developing data stream systems, believe it or not. It's not Mike Stonebreaker anymore, it's Mike Franklin, but whatever. Okay, so some of you know these characters. Okay, so same query. One system would give you those same readings. That was the Berkeley system, actually. It would give you those same readings. System number two, happened to be our system, gave just two, 74 and 58. Okay? We decided that when there were ties and timestamps, you couldn't distinguish the order of them where they decided that order was relevant, even if you had a tie in the timestamp. So in our system, you'd have these three, and then you wouldn't have three more recent readings until you got three more at 7 o'clock. I'm not saying one system was right or wrong. I'll only say it's not good news when you have two different systems with apparently the same query and getting different answers. So another example where people just wouldn't think in advance, I really need to be very careful about how I define the semantics of these queries over this data model I've defined. People thought streams were extremely simple and it would be obvious how they behaved, but it really wasn't true. Okay? All right, and the last one I want to talk about is uncertain data. Any questions? Yeah. Oh, if I get the question, repeat the question. Okay, I will do that. Yep, thank you. Okay, so this is the most technical example. If you lose it at any point, don't worry, because after this we're going to come to teaching, which is a totally different topic. Okay, so I'm going to motivate this particular trickiness with um, just through an example. The whole thing's just going to be one example. And this example is a crime-solving database, a rather simple one. You're going to have a crime. You're going to have people, this is two tables. You're going to have tuples in a table that said witnesses saw a car. And you're going to have another table that says a car is driven by a person. Okay? And if you want a suspect in your, ta in your crime, it's just one crime, you just do the natural join of those. Someone is a suspect in the crime if they drive a car that was seen by a witness, right? Very easy, extremely simple, okay? But what if both of these are uncertain? What if it actually is that a witness might have seen a car and a car might be driven by a person? That complicates things a lot. So uncertain databases, abstractly, an uncertain database is defined to capture a set of all possible certain databases. It's known as possible instances. Okay? And I'll explain this in a moment. So we might then have, say, Kathy saw either a Honda or a Mazda. Amy might have seen an Acura. A Honda is driven by Billy or Frank. That's all uncertainty. Okay? The concrete representation I'm going to use is alternative values for tuples and question marks, which mean a tuple may or may not exist. There may be annotations. The work that we did also had confidence values or probabilities. I'm not going to talk about that here, but we did have that. That just complicates things too much. The point can be made easily without them. So here are two uncertain tables. 
The first table has two tuples. The value of the first tuple is either Kathy Honda or Kathy Mazda, two possible values. The second is Amy Acura may or may not exist. So there's four possible concrete tables. Two possibilities for the first tuple and presence or absence of the second tuple, four possibilities. This one drives has two possible concrete tables. A Honda driven by Billy or a Honda driven by Frank? Yes? Uh, I would have put Amy Acura, double class Amy Bottom or something. Yeah, that's an alternative. We thought about that, but we decided not to do it that way. But that would work too. You could do it with nulls, null values, or bottom. Yep. It amounts to the same thing. It won't change anything. Oh, well. It's just a representational question. Won't change anything. Nope. Nope. Okay. So here's the dilemma. That nice model of alternative values and question marks is not closed. And by closed, I mean if you ask a question of data in that model, can you represent the answer in the model? One of the great things about relational database systems is that they are closed. When you ask a question over tables in a relational database, you get a table back. And that's a big feature because you can ask queries on queries on queries. It's a huge positive. All right, this model is not closed. I'm going to extend this on the second one to have three tuples now. So there's the Honda, then there's Jimmy who drives a Toyota or a Mazda, and Hank definitely drives a Honda. Okay? And I want to generate my suspects by joining the two tables. So remember, a suspect is someone who, in this case, might drive a car that might have been seen. That's a suspect might drive a car that might have been seen. Here is, oops, here is the answer, okay? Billy or Frank might be suspects because Billy or Frank drive a Honda and Kathy might have seen a Honda. Jimmy might be a suspect because Jimmy might have driven a Toyota and, wait, did I get that right? Jimmy might have driven a Mazda and Kathy might have seen a Mazda. And Hank might be a suspect because he drives a Honda and Kathy might have seen a Honda. We're not even going to use the second tuple there. This does not capture all the possible instances in the result. Can anybody explain why this is not the correct result? Because Jimmy and Billy were Frank are mutually excluded. Yes, Jimmy. So there's some mutual exclusions and actually mutual inclusions, it turns out. So if, let's say that Hank is in the answer. If Hank is in the answer, that means that Kathy saw a Honda, right? If Hank is in the answer, Kathy saw a Honda, that means Kathy can't have seen a Mazda, which means Jimmy can't be in the answer, which is, I think, what you said. If Billy or Frank is in the answer, then Kathy must have seen the Honda, so Hank must be in the answer. So there's some mutual exclusions, mutual inclusions, OK? The fact is that it, you can prove that it is impossible to express this answer in this data model. It's provably, provably not closed. So here's the solution. The solution to the problem turned out to be add to the result the concept of lineage. Keep track of where your answer came from. Okay? If you keep track of where your answer came from, you can actually get correct answer. So we store lineage with each result. It tells us the values it was derived from, and then we define the meaning of a table with lineage to be the consistent possible instances. So we just add the lineage there, and that will tell us with the lineage that um, I, I just gave two examples. It'll tell us with the lineage which mutual inclusions and exclusions you have. And in fact, we prove that with data and lineage, it makes the model closed. For any query over this data model, you can represent the result accurately with data plus lineage, which we thought was a pretty cool result. But that's not what I'm going to tell you is cool. What was cool is that we did this in the context of a project called TRIO. And we called it TRIO because we were building a system for data plus uncertainty plus lineage. And that probably makes sense to you now when you see this. But actually, we started the project with no idea whatsoever that lineage was going to be key to our data model. 
We started it because there were a lot of applications that seemed to need both uncertainty and lineage, especially scientific applications, which just a lot of them had uncertain data. And also, you seem to want to maybe keep track of where your answers came from, maybe because of the uncertainty. So that was why we started the project. We never imagined that the lineage would be the key to representing uncertainty. So I always look back and say, why? Is there some implicit connection in those applications? It's possible that there is. And that's why we had a lot of applications that needed both. Was it some unconscious, unconscious hunch, divine intervention, pure luck? I don't know, but I'm going to call that a magic moment when we realized that there was this very significant theoretical connection between two components that we just put together because they were needed by applications. OK. That is the end of the research part. I'm now going to tell you about MOOCs and MOICs. And I think I'll hold questions at this point. We can come back if there are technical questions. <laughs> oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I think we have a significant amount of time for questions at the end. If it's really quick. OK, because I want to get through MOOCs and MOICs. All right. So I am going to now take us to the fall of 2011 when Stanford offered three computer science courses free to the world. It was, I think, a kind of big moment, at least we felt like it was at Stanford. Um, those are now known as MOOCs or Massive Open Online Courses. Um, it, I would say, instantly launched an online education frenzy in some ways that's still going strong. I always get this question, what's the ultimate direction and impact? I think it's still anyone's guess. Don't know the answer to that. How many people remember that fall of 2011 when those courses came out? OK. Dave so, Potter. sorry? Dave Potter and John Henderson. No, but they just won the Turing Award. <laughs> they did not do a massive open online course that I know of. They might have done one eventually, but the first three courses was Andrew Ng's machine learning course, Sebastian Thrun's artificial intelligence, and my introduction to databases. So those were the three courses. Uh, Sebastian actually also, I'll just, one quick aside. I was department, computer science department chair, and I walked in one day, and the department manager says, you better look at this. And that made me very nervous when she said that. And there was Sebastian Thrun overnight had um, posted a web page that said, Stanford's artificial intelligence class, free to the world. Compute, compete with Stanford students. Get Stanford uh, certificates. Said all kinds of really things he should never have said. He, but we got him to calm that down. But actually, that was the day, in my opinion. It was August 2011. I remember that. That was the day that I think things changed. So it was pretty interesting. And after Sebastian announced that Andrew Ng uh, convinced me to, uh, he, he said, I'm going to put my course online too. How about you do databases? And I agreed. We had all been getting ready to do flipped classrooms at that time. So I'd actually prepared quite a bit of material already. So it wasn't that hard to do. Anyway, I was teaching a class at Stanford called CS145, Introduction to Databases. Had about 150 students in it. Nowadays, it's about 300. And I was simultaneously had 60,000 students enrolled. That is not a good number. I hate it when people who do online courses talk about enrollments. My mother enrolled in the course. All you have to do to enroll is sign up, right? OK, so, but 26,000 of them submitted at least one assignment, and 6,500 completed the course. The first time 10% was a typical completion rate. It's down since then. The class is still available. I'm going to talk about that. At this point, there's been about a million accounts, I'll call it, um, about 8 million video views, about 600,000 assignment submissions, and about 30,000 statements of accomplishment where a course has been completed. All right. So just briefly want to clarify online education. There's really three different things. One is the flipped classroom or blended classroom where you're teaching at a university and you decide to use some online tools or lectures. So flipped classroom is fairly popular. One, another is when you put courses online, course materials online for self-study. So MIT was very early, for example, in putting a lot of course materials online, but they didn't have synchronous lectures. And then the third is an actual synchronous public course offering, called, which people now call MOOC. All of them actually rely on the basic set of materials, making videos, purpose-made short videos with embedded quizzes, 
You might have quiz, standalone quizzes, automatically check programming exercises, support materials, and so on. So I had all three of these, and I used them in all three ways. I had a flipped classroom, I had course materials online, and, and several public course offerings. So I would say that fall of 2011, when I did my first MOOC, was one of the most invigorating things I've done. I was really into it. It was one of the most invigorating teaching experiences, having people all over the world. In fact, I'm even going to say it was one of the most invigorating things I've done in my entire career to date. It was very, very exciting having all those students worldwide. And that's a magic moment. Yes? Yeah. To everybody. Yeah, so the question is about a textbook and what the difference is. I think the MOOC is the new textbook. It's got it's a multimedia textbook. It's got automatically checked programming exercises. It depends on the class. It's a different mode. But I would argue that some of the materials, like the automatically checked exercises, is beyond a textbook. But we could debate that one for sure. I know at least one person in the room was, took that MOOC. How many people here took that 2011 MOOC? Oh, wow, a lot. That's great. In 2011 or later? 2011. All right. OK, so this was a surprisingly personal experience. And those who took it will know this. I actually created every week a screen side chat where I talked to the students. It was a video, and I really felt like I was talking to them. There was these fireside chats from FDR, Franklin Roosevelt. So most people didn't know that's what I was referring to. Um, this was Thanksgiving. This was winter, pretending it's winter in California. Um, <laughs> The students were extremely appreciative. This was, our, this was on a platform that students were building about a week ahead of us using it. So it's not looks beautiful. But these are the students introducing themselves. I'm 22 years old, high school dropout. I'm you know, 71, just ran the Boston Marathon. Um, these are uh, students thanking at the end, thanks, you're a rock star. Nobody else had told me that. This is someone who wrote a poem. <laughs> the students, they came rushing in from far and near and everywhere to gaze upon this wondrous thing for all, uh, a precious gift for all to share. They sent me things. It was amazing. There was a top student, uh, Amy Cunningham. Amy Cunningham answered 900 questions on the discussion group. Everyone was answered perfectly with the right answer in perfect English with supporting examples. It was amazing. I actually. Well, this actually is people talking about her, um, how amazing she was. Some people thought she was me in disguise. Um, this person proposed marriage to her in XML. Um, I found her after the class was over, and I found her, and I flew her to have lunch with me at Stanford. Um, she was in San Diego, UCSD graduate, working at her family's company tried to convince her to come to Stanford for a master's, and she turned me down. <laughs> but that was a magic moment for sure. OK. So any downsides to online courses? Um, a few. So I'm acting very enthusiastic. It was great. It was really fun. There were the complainers. They did all that work. And at the end, all they got was a PDF that said they'd finished the class. And people said, what? That's all I'm getting, and it doesn't even say Stanford on it? And someone else said, um, this is on the discussion group, someone else said, of course it says Stanford on it. It says, this is not a Stanford class. You did not get Stanford credit. <laughs> someone else said, you can just edit the PDF if you don't like it. So there was a little bit of a war at the end uh, among the people who were disappointed with their PDF after all that work. There were cheaters. So I had a midterm and a final that the students had to take. When they opened it, they had two hours to do it. And then that was it. And, I had, and it had like 30 multiple choice questions, 50 or something. I had students finish that, final, that exam in two minutes with a perfect score. Because we know how long they spent. How did they do that? They got two accounts. They got one account to get the exam, download it, or think about it. 
and then they use their other account to get a perfect score. I didn't care because I wasn't giving Stanford credit. They were not a Stanford student. It was not a Stanford <laughs> course. But this is a major issue, obviously, for online courses. And then I would say the subsequent offerings weren't as personally rewarding for me as the first one because um, at that point there were a lot more MOOCs. People were getting almost entitled about them. So it wasn't the, you know, it wasn't the Wild West anymore. Okay. Current status, I took actually, after three synchronous offerings of the 10-week course, I divided it into 14 mini courses, specified a bunch of pathways through them. It's self-study now, so no synchronous offerings. The plus side, it's available continuously. The minus side is you don't really have significant community because everybody's doing things at different times. Um, but I still get a steady stream of thank yous. Really quite often somebody will email me. So, and this is just passive. I'm not doing anything at all. I'm not monitoring. I haven't I looked at it in years, actually, at this point. All right. So again, I think I'll skip questions. And I'll just close with the last section of the talk, which is the dawn of the MOIC. The MOIC is the massive open in-person course instead of the massive open online course. And whom, how many of you have heard of MOICs? I hope it's nobody. Because so far, I think I'm the only one who knows that term or has done a MOIC, as far as I know. So it isn't really catching on, but I want to tell you about my MOIC. So in this version of the massive open course, instead of making it online, you get on an airplane and you travel all over the world and you offer the course in person in developing countries. So this is what I decided to do with my sabbatical that I took about a year and a half ago. And I wanted to do that for a couple reasons. One, because I enjoyed the MOOC so much um, I wanted to try it where I actually saw the people. And the others I actually just like to travel, bottom line. I really enjoy traveling. So I was had a sabbatical coming. I decided I wanted to do something that was sort of good for the world. I thought about you know, going to a foundation or something like that, but I came up with this sort of self-made idea. So it took the convergence of a number of things to make this MOIC work. One of them was having a sabbatical. And believe it or not, I had to argue to Stanford why this was OK to do on sabbatical, because sabbaticals, it turns out, are supposed to be about research. And the reason they're supposed to be about research is they're paid for by the overhead on grants. Now, I never knew that. Stanford pays for people's sabbatical with the overhead it collects from research grants so people can refresh their research. Anyway, I argued this was research. Uh, you need suitable material to teach to people in developing countries. I happen to teach about data, which is now big data, which is what everybody wants to hear about. Um, need funding. I got some funding from ACM, the Computing Society, from VLDB, from Google, and from my own discretionary funds. And I would say probably travel experience and endurance is also necessary for the type of thing that I did. So I'm not sure that MOIC is going to catch on, because there's a lot of sort of preconditions there. Um, it was also completely self-fashioned and organizing. So I organized the whole thing. The first thing I had to learn how to do to organize this was to make a website. So I learned Squarespace. My other, my regular website is like HTML from 1994, but I learned the modern version. I made a website. Uh, I even had tabs, courses, hosting, schedule, feedback, sponsors. There are things under each of those. So this was kind of fun on its own. OK, and then I organized my material, my big data material. And you, uh, to go out to developing countries, you better be really organized. So I developed modules for each of these things, spreadsheets, visualization, relational databases, data mining, machine learning, Python, R, so on, network analysis. Each one of those modules, I told them what background they need, what software they need, uh, the length of the module. And then the places I went would pick parts of those to do. They would pick pathways through those based on how much time they had and the background of the students. So that took a lot of organization. I spent a summer doing most of this. I have since, by the way, packaged all this into a Stanford course. And I teach big data for non-computer science majors at Stanford, with all, pretty much covering all of this material. It's turned out to be a pretty popular course for students, out, again, outside of computer science. In terms of the teaching tools that I used, 
Um, for software, I decided to use Google Sheets. I didn't want to use Excel because I didn't want people to have to buy software. But everywhere I went, either they got uh, Microsoft tools at their university, or sometimes I'd say, do you have Excel? And they'd say yes, and I'd say, where'd you get it? And they all laugh. OK, <laughs> that happens a lot, actually, because um, it's pirated. Um, so I use Google Sheets. I use Tableau, the data visualization system. And then Jupyter Notebooks, um, which is an excellent teaching tool. Uh, but I didn't want to expect everybody to install it. So I actually have a cloud service uh, a company called Instabase donated uh, Jupyter Notebooks on the cloud, AWS, and Google Cloud. I have a couple data sets that they work with in the course. Um, and then one of the big things I discovered is that if I bring prizes with me, like Stanford sunglasses and Google notebooks, they were, I would give those prizes to the first few people to finish each little assignment. They would really be motivated. So they love those prizes. OK. So I kind of got a way of doing things. Now, where did I go? And how did I organize that? Figuring out where to go, I'm, I went partly through ACM, the professional society. They emailed some chapters. Um, I picked out some for them to email, offering me to come. I'm, it's free for me to come, but they need to organize. Some of my foreign graduate students, other connections. One person in Tanzania, I said, why, how'd you find me? He said, I searched for big data. And I came across your page, and I said, a free course in big data here in Tanzania. I'll take it. So that was pretty random. Um, I have three requirements for the places that I go. First of all, that the people there have passable English. One time in Chile, I took a student who speaks Spanish, but generally no translation. And I didn't do live translation. He just helped the students. Uh, an acceptable venue. Um, that means I need internet, and that has been the biggest problem, because we use Google Sheets and we use the Jupyter Notebooks on the cloud. That's been an issue. Um, and then by far the most important thing is an organized and responsive host going to these developing countries. So I, they didn't know it, but when we were initially emailing, I was interviewing them. They just didn't know to see whether that would be a good place to go. Everywhere worked out pretty well. At a typical stop, I would do a big data short course between one and four days. I'm going to do a five-day one this summer. In five days, I'll be able to cover everything, the whole Stanford course, actually, because I teach 9 to 5 or 9 to 6 every day when I'm there, so I can really cover a lot. Then I realized that at Stanford, we have something called the D School. Anybody know the Stanford D School and the concept of design thinking? It's just this complete, I'm not even going to try to explain it, but it's, a, it's basically a problem-solving methodology that uses a lot of sticky notes and is world famous, look it up. And I said, well, this is something people love, learning how to do this problem solving methodology. And Stanford is the world center of it. It's gotten very popular. So I got trained by the D School to do one day design thinking workshops. So I always put some sticky notes in my suitcase. And I'll do typically a one day workshop. <laughs> this is for 25 people. The big data short course, I've had up to 500 in it. Um, and then typically I'll also say, hey, get the women together. If they're interested, we'll have dinner or some kind of round table. So that would be a typical stop. OK, here's where I've been. So you can just take a look at that. Um, so my sabbatical was cut short, actually. I was in Indonesia when I got a call from the provost at, at 1 AM saying, where are you? I said, Indonesia, it's 1 AM. And she said, are you interested in applying for dean? And so then I actually did get cut short. Um, it was only about six months. Um, and I have to admit, Mexico, I sent one of my colleagues, because that was right after I became dean. Um, but I've been to 17 or 18 countries now. and. I am continue, continuing this while I'm dean. So I'm trying to do two one-week trips a year. So I went to the Philippines just about a month ago, two months ago. And the next trip will be Ghana uh, in June. Um, so anyway, that's where I've been. So I just thought I'd show you a few pictures. And this is the end of the talk. Um, i just mention a couple of them. This is what's one of my favorite stops. It's the country of Bhutan, where they wear national dress. And that was all, that was my class. It was pretty big. 
Uh, Nigeria, the students were extremely enthusiastic. India I was treated like a queen. You can see the design thinking workshops. That's, so most of these are the big data. These two guys, this was in Namibia. These guys sat in the front of the room and were slouched and ultra cool. And these are the sunglasses they won because they, got, they won all the prizes. They were really talented and they're the only people I told them to contact me if they want help with their career. I normally didn't want to do that, but in that particular country, they, the country was so not good and they were so good that I said that to them and I hope they do. And then in Indonesia, I was driving along when I saw that billboard. I'm not kidding. Um, I, uh, yeah, so I had to go back and get a picture. Um, that was pretty remarkable. Anyway, these were all magic moments, obviously, uh, with this experience. And with that, I'm done. And I will answer questions about anything at all that I've covered today. If we want, we can start with the question that I rebuffed. Um, so, my question is, so, how exactly do you make sure that your foundations are correct before, say, coding? You just like think about how do you make sure your foundations are correct before coding? In the long version of the talk, I have a feedback loop. In fact, your foundations aren't always correct. And so, so really, you develop foundations, you start building a system, you try using the system on some applications, and you have a feedback loop. And so you don't always know. That's the answer. Yep. Great question, though. Yes. Who else had a question? Uh, how, do you, uh, how do you assess the efficacy of this? Uh, being, being inundated by a fire hose 9 to 5 by day. Yeah. How do you, yeah, how do you, ex ask, ex how do you assess the efficacy of this? The truth is that. Many of these students will use some of the tools that they learn and techniques. So there's, they, we cover a lot, and some of them email me and say that they did. I think the real amplification comes through the instructors and lecturers and professors who participate. And many of them have actually taken the materials and you are using them themselves. And many of them also say that my teaching style was so different from what they're used to because it's very interactive, um, that they're changing their teaching style. So I can't numerically assess it, but, and I, but I think the real amplification in terms of massive is through the instructors. Um, I actually, so one interesting thing is that this company, Instabase, that runs the Jupyter Notebooks, um, I get all the accounts through them and they can actually see what people are doing and they tell me that people, they keep their accounts forever and they tell me that people are using their accounts quite a bit. In fact, they knew that in, I think it was Tanzania, that somebody was doing a project for the government on something, they could actually see it in there. But I don't, the truth is I don't have any um, formal what assessment. What was the exposure of total number of students compared to one iteration of the movement? The number of students is probably, I've had somewhere in the maybe 5,000 kind of students. So comparable to one iteration. Comparable to one iteration, yeah. But I don't know if they, what they, you know, some of them were probably sitting there not doing the class. I couldn't always know what they were doing. Okay. Yeah, and I haven't added up the number, actually. I just sort of did a quick Whereas mental. For your first book, I believe you said 6,000, 6,500 6, finished it, finished it, but 20-some thousand did some of it. Okay. This is not scalable. I mean, to call it a moik is mostly a joke. Um, it's. Yeah, it's not scalable the way in online classes, but it's certainly, um, well, so for many students, they wouldn't have the discipline necessarily to do an online course, but they would have the discipline to do this. Well, but it's a template that other academics can follow. This one? Yeah. Sure. <laughs> as long as they have sabbatical, a topic that can easily be brought to a developing country and people are interested in, and they have the money, and they have a lot of travel endurance. Because I, that took a lot of endurance, actually. And like I said, when I go there, I teach all day, every day, because I want to make the most of being there. And I've stayed in some pretty shady places, too. <laughs> yes, and some pretty nice ones. Like, the, my places I've stayed have ranged from very ugh to five-star hotels. So, yeah, because some of them put me up. Some of them don't. Yes? Or whoever. Oh, I'll let you. Okay, you can be the. You, yeah. Your question and then your question. Okay. So it's my turn. Yes. Uh, I have a 
have a question about that moves. I have a feeling that uh, using video for teaching programming is not a good way of doing it. And I would like to get your point on that. If video is a good way of teaching? Oh, is not a good way of teaching. So I think there, and I'll maybe come back to that textbook question again if you want. Um, I think there is a purpose for videos. I think that students, let's talk about the student point of view. A student who goes and sits in the back of a lecture hall and listens to a lecture might have been better off watching that on video if, that's, if they're totally passive. Because when we have record classes, students say that they fast forward through some parts and review some parts multiple times. But a student who's sitting in a lecture and interacting with the professor, asking questions, getting answers, that's much better to be in person. So there are trade-offs. I wouldn't, a video doesn't replace a lecture. But many students, I don't know about here, but at Stanford, in the classes where we record the class and put it online, some classes will see only 20% of the students showing up in person because they want to, they'll just, they want to sleep in, they know they can watch the video later, they claim it's because they want to fast forward and rewatch certain parts. I don't know if that's true or not. So a video definitely doesn't replace a lecture. Back to your question about textbook. So I would say I like to joke that the MOOC is the modern day textbook, um, but it's sort of, it's a different medium. Um, I think students, I'm sorry to say, don't always read entire textbooks anymore. So this might give them the portion that they want. But I also would say if all a MOOC is is a video of lectures, then you, know, you might get something, we might, maybe you stay awake longer. But I think it's packaging it up with other materials, interactive materials. Or, and discussion groups, especially the discussion group. When the first MOOC I had, part of the joy was seeing all the people very active on the discussion group. So it's just a different thing. I wouldn't compare it that way. Did I answer your question at all? Do you want to try again? OK. By the way, you can ask about the lineage and uncertain data if you want, or you know, that's fine too. I think there's been two things that have changed. I don't know whether I'd envision them or not. Two things that have been popularized. One is around peer grading. So one of the things that's not scalable in a MOOC is the grading of work. And so when we did our MOOCs in 2011, all of it was just automatically graded. And there was sort of an assumption the only classes you could do were ones where they could be graded automatically, because how can you grade 6,000 students? But this idea now of peer grading has actually gotten fairly popular. And people have done research in when it's effective and when it's not effective. So that's one thing that's come in. Another has come in. There's a fair number of MOOCs that actually form teams of students to do team projects, students who don't know each other. Um, and that's often a disaster. Um, because if you have a 10% completion rate and you form the team at the beginning, people keep dropping out, and so that's been a problem. But that's been a couple of things that have developed. No, I mean, like, are there things that you would uh, want to change in how they are run now? Would I change my MOOC? I don't think I would change mine, if that's the question. I think for databases, which is a pretty straightforward topic, also excellently one that doesn't evolve very fast, um, like, it's still the same as 30 years ago, so I think my MOOC could endure another 30 years. Um, uh, no, it's okay. I mean, I really like that, I, again, I mean, I seriously mean databases is a slowly evolving topic, which is great. So I can just leave it sitting there and it's still modern. I took a couple of videos down. I had one on, uh, I had one on MapReduce, and I think I had one on data warehousing that I thought got a little out of date, so I just took them out of the class. In, I mean, if I wanted to, I could make new ones, but I haven't. Yeah. You talked about um, using a flipped classroom. Yeah. So my understanding is you want to have the students read or watch video or something before coming to the class. Mm -hmm. So how do you motivate the students to do that preparation work? So the flip, when I did the flipped classroom, which I did two or three times, um, the classroom time was devoted, sometimes I did sort of advanced uh, problem solving. 
Like I'd bring in a hard problem that had many parts and we'd work through it during the class and they would talk to each other in groups and then I'd talk about the solution and they'd do more of that. A couple times I had uh, programming contests where we actually, they came in and we said, here's a data set. Actually, we did one side that we, they could pick relational or XML as an unstructured data set and then competed to get the answer and we had prizes. Sometimes I had guest lectures. Some of those, they wouldn't be able to do it if they hadn't looked at the material in advance. Um, but it was, I would say, more augmenting the core material. And I would say, if you want to, if you're coming today and you want to enter the contest, you better have done this. Or if you're coming today and you want to understand, you better have done this. That's how I approached it. Flipped classrooms have had a mixed reception at Stanford. Uh, when they, so flipped classrooms started around the same time. We had some that were, were a real disaster. The faculty used them to double the material in the class, for example. So they'd say, oh, good, I can put all my material for the class online, and then I can do twice as much by adding the, the classroom. Some were disorganized about how they used classroom time. So I would say the flipped classroom is a mixed bag at this point. Yep. But anyway, the way they were motivated was they wouldn't be able to do it without but I didn't require it by any means. Yep. Some people would give pop quizzes to make sure they looked at it. Yep. One question here. Um, so this MOIC experience is clearly a very different um, environment and atmosphere, right? How the process was happening. And I was wondering if there was something that um, you learned for your own teaching back, back here um, from that experience and maybe something you could share with us as, as teachers? Yeah, so what I... Well, what I learned from the teaching, which I don't know is that necessary at Stanford, is how to adapt the level of the material and the way I did it, taught it, very rapidly on the spot as I understood how much the students knew or didn't know. So I had this one place I went where I thought the students knew how to program, and so I'd given them like a skeleton of the program. They had to add some stuff to make it. It was, I think, a data visualization and you know change a few things, and they were just so stuck. And finally I said, how about if you just change the color of the dots from blue to red? And they did, and they all got so excited. So that was like, bring. they just didn't know what they were doing. And other times I'd discover on the spot the students were really advanced, and I would have to just, on the, at the moment, try to make harder problems for them. So you know, you know, how about trying five different machine learning models instead of one, right? Those are two extremes. So I learned how to adapt very rapidly on the spot. That's, I'd say, the one thing I really changed in my teaching was to be more in tune to what they were, how good they were, and how to change things. Um, but that doesn't translate really to Stanford, where I kind of know what I'm getting with the students. Although when I teach this to non-computer science students, there's still a range, but kind of a predictable range, I would say. Did you feel the same group dynamic in those groups that the, within the classroom? Were groups working in the same manner that they would be in, say, North America? Um, no, but I don't have. So the question was whether what was the classroom dynamic? It was different in different countries. Um, so I don't think there's one single answer. Most of them were also very motivated because they knew I was there for a few days and they were trying to get the most out of it. So that was nice. I think I could feel that motivation. A lot of countries, they are afraid to talk to the professor. That was pretty common and that's certainly not true at Stanford. Um, yeah, no simple, gen no simple generalization, I would say. Yep. Any other questions? Yes. Good. Back to the first part of the talk. Yep. It's interesting, but it felt like each and every one of those assumptions was pioneering a whole field in databases. Um, could you give a more specific example of an assumption that you would draw, but within a sort of that is specific of what we have now? Because each one of them was how is the relational process. Each one of those assumptions was sort of narrow, I would say, kind of. I would call those kind of narrow assumptions. Uh, you could make another, here's another example that I haven't worked on was ages ago, the assumption that all your data is on one computer, right? That's a good one. 
All of a sudden, my data is on multiple computers. It changes everything, right? That's just another example that I hadn't happened to work on. So I think the assumptions themselves are pretty narrow. The impact is pretty large. I think that's sort of the whole point, in a way. Narrow assumption, big, Im big impact on the system. Yeah. So I, of course, all this is in retrospect. It's easy to say this in retrospect. Right. Yep. Any other questions from the first part of the talk? If anybody remembers it. Yep. The lineage topic. This one? Yeah. So, so you basically track the timing when the, when the data uh, has been observed. It's not the timing. When you, and there should, I guess, I should, maybe I should have put it here too. There would be one more set of arrows from Hank. So when you compute your query answer from the data, in addition to the data itself, you keep pointers to the original data it came from. And that allows you to have an interpretation of your answer where you can't have inconsistencies. Like if I'm going to have Jimmy in my answer, then I know that it had to have come from Kathy Mazda, and I can't have Billy in the answer also. So, and that, I mean, and so that you can see that. I think the more interesting thing here is actually the, the, the result that this closes the model, that, that you can capture every possible query result once you do this. That was, sort of the, that was the interesting theoretical result, which also justifies building a system where those are the pieces of the system. That makes sense? Yep. 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 You know, actually, I have to be honest, we built this one as a layer on top of Postgres. So we have, this was actually a layered system. We didn't start this, this particular one we didn't happen to build from scratch. So, yeah. So the answer is yes. Again, I simplified a little bit in what I said. Yep. Thanks, Jennifer, again.